So I see you're headed down the cellular IoT trail, huh? Hoping to design yourself the world's greatest edge computing, cellular connected, internet of things design ever created? I see. Well, you know it's a connectivity jungle out there, right? We really should make sure you're packed and ready to go. So, have you got your network configurations all set? How are you doing with your connection modes? And you do have a variety of LTE bands packed, right? And of course, you've got your device management scheme, development tools, firmware and middleware, memory management, security protocols, some bear spray. Wait, just kidding about that last one. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Come back. I'm not even halfway done. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, cellular connectivity is complicated, and yes, it's easy to underpack or overpack that bag of cellular essentials you need for your next IoT design. Don't worry, my friends. We're here to help. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Christian Sather from Nordic Semiconductor and I are talking about how you can take the easiest path to cellular connectivity in your next design with the Nordic NRF9160 low power system and package with integrated LTEM and narrowband IoT modem and GPS. We've got many connected miles to go before morning, my friends, so we best get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Nordic Semiconductor. Hi, Christian. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here. Okay, so we're talking all about cellular internet designs today. But before we go much further, can you set the stage for us? What does the overall wireless networking arena look like these days? Yeah, sure. So why the area network is complex for a lot of people. And the best way to start is probably think about your cell phone, which is cellular connected using technology, which we refer to as 3G or 4G or in the future 5G, designed for very high bandwidth, not very low power. Then you have something called 2G, which we used in the past. This is quickly being phased out, actually, because 5G and new technologies are coming. The big network operators want to turn it off to reuse their bandwidth and, their, and the backhaul and everything for that. If you look at what is needed for small devices, machine to machine, we need very low power. Traditionally, what we refer to as sub gigahertz, which is different type of networks. The challenge with this is they are unlicensed. So that means that there's a lot of standards and today there's not one standard that everyone can use because lack of standardizations. A few years back, what was referred to as Heller IoT came up. This was designed to be a very low power network connectivity that was based and used to existing cellular network. In Nordic, we jumped on this immediately because as you may know, we are big on Bluetooth Low Energy. We low open standards where everyone can play. This is an open standard. It's based on existing infrastructure around the world used for cell phones today. In that sense, it's future-proof, designed for high throughput, and most importantly for many, high security and reliability and high quality of service. That's what sets us apart from existing low-power networks in the world today. So it seems to me that just about everything is connected these days, and a lot of time that means cellular capability, right? Yeah, exactly. So everything is connected today, but still these things are not really cellular today. The reason is that 2G that was used in the past is high power, so not fitted for a lot of things. And consumer and a lot of uh, industrial today are either using Bluetooth Low Energy or they're using sub gigahertz, as I mentioned. But these technologies have all challenges. So I can take two examples really quick. Healthcare uses no connectivity or Bluetooth Low Energy to a large extent today. But as we may know, there is uh, in Western world alone hundreds of millions of elderly people with disabled mental health that cannot really use cell phones or cannot install a gateway. So in order to get the data from a Bluetooth device up to a nurse or up to the cloud, they don't know how to operate gateway. And cellular actually remove this gateway because you directly connect up to the cloud. And that's a way for people to get access to health technology and not have to think about how to connect and how to actually talk to the nurse, connect to the nurse, or send data to the nurse. Another good example is uh, metering, because metering is using wireless technology extensively today. But it's very hard for the big utility manufacturers to make a single product that can ship to the whole world, because it's very fragmented. 
in terms of connectivity. Now they can build one product and they can ship it around the world because cellular works across the globe because 4G and cellular is there everywhere. So then you may think that cellular should be everywhere today, right? But cellular is still a fairly new technology and cellular is not really easy today. And that's a challenge that we want to talk about today. So why is cellular not easy? It's pretty difficult in three different ways. First, to build cellular connectivity, you need a piece of hardware that do your application. You typically need a modem that can connect to the network. Then you need a lot of software to piece that together. Then you need a SIM card. Then you need an operator with a deal so that you get access to data and can transfer data. Then you want to send the data somewhere, such as the clouds. So you need the cloud connectivity and you need a cloud. Then this is wireless, right? So wireless means battery operated. So it has to be low power. I'm going to talk about low power today, but inherently cellular is not low power if you compare it to Bluetooth low energy and other technologies that many are used to. Secondly, in cellular networks, the networks are in control. So as an edge node or a small device, when you want to connect, it's actually the network that tells you how much power, how many repetitions you have to use, what modulating scheme you have to use in order to get your data through. And the third thing is that modem and then microcontrollers have to interact here, and that interaction is also, can also be power hungry. And then you have to stitch all this together because it's a world today where you have to get bits and pieces for different places. It can be hard to get support. And in the end, you've done that. You have to certify everything and then deploy it and make sure that you follow all the strict certification regulations that are around the world. How does Nordic address these issues? Yeah, that's a really good question because when Nordic set out to do seller IoT, we had never done IoT before. We were big on Bluetooth Low Energy. And what we saw when we looked at seller IoT was a world that was very complex and that had some challenges that we in Nordic traditionally solved in three very distinct ways. First of all, we targeted and set out to do the highest level of integration so that you don't have to go many places to get the hardware you need. Secondly, we built everything from scratch so that we can ensure that we had a very, very low power solution. The third thing is that we have a business model that we want to address basically thousands of customers and a lot of different applications. Traditional cell phone world is a few large, large players that make cell phones or tablets and give it to the customers. But we want to address a market that a lot of small and medium-sized companies that want to build new and innovative seller IoT products. All right, let's start with integration. Yeah, integration is the first good thing to start because we can start at the hardware, which is very specific and a lot of people are concerned about. So if you look at what we call the NRF9160, which is our cellular product, this is really a small system and package, a 16 by 10 millimeter. It contains both a modem that is able to connect over LTM and narrowband IoT, the two big cellular IT standards, with the GPS for location. But it also have an ARM Cortex-33 microcontroller for you as the customer to write your application using inside the same system and package. In addition to that, we call multiband, meaning we support all the big frequency bands that are used around the world. And we have pre-certified it. So you don't have to do any additional certification unless you build a product or are in a market that require additional certifications, of course. Nice. Yeah. So if you look at the 9160 in a little more detail, inside our system in package, there is a system on chip. So really a chip that contains both the modem and the application processor. So this supports both LTM and narrowband IoT, which is the two big standards today. It's future-proof to the extent that we continue to develop new software releases and we continue to build a new functionality as 3DPP, which defines all the specifications for cellular release new standards. It's half duplex and it support frequency division duplex. For you as a user, this really means that we have built and built on the standard, which is the lowest cost and the lowest power in terms of how you transfer data. We also support the two main power saving modes that exist in cellular network, EDRX and PSM. We support what we refer to as coverage enhancement modes, meaning that if there is really poor network connection for some reasons, our modem has the capability to support the highest output power that's allowed on the network and do a lot of repetitions and clever modulations to get the data through. We also run all the typical IP stacks and connectivity stacks that you need to connect inside the modem, such as IP, TCP, and TLS for security. As a user, you don't have to worry about that 
because everything is taken care of in the modem and these are big complex stacks that continuously are developed and maintained for security reasons and so on. Yeah, and of course there is SIM interface. You can connect a SIM card, which you need to get access. And there is a GPS, which is really nice because a lot of cellular IT application is about asset tracking. And then you don't have to get a separate GPS anymore to do that. So from previous Chalk Talks, I know that the RF front end is very important here. What all does that include? So we decided early on to put the front end inside our system and package so that you as a user don't have to worry about that either, right? Because as you say, it's important, but it's difficult for many people. We support down to minus 108 dBm RX sensitivity for LTM and minus 104 in dBm sensitivity for narrowband IoT. Most importantly, we support 23 dBm output power, which is the highest that's allowed in the network, which is a very valuable feature because a lot of devices are placed in remote areas or they are submerged. There are utility meters and things like that. So you don't necessarily have really good connection and everything. Wide band support from 700 megahertz up to 2.2 gigahertz basically mean that the system and package can be used all around the globe, even though that there is a big difference as to which frequency bands are used by different countries and different network operators. And of course we put in on-chip balloons. So everything you have to do to get connected here is basically connect antenna through a single pin 50 ohm standard interface. We customized and built this front end together with a key partner of us, Corvo. So that when we get to the power section later, you will also see that a low power system on chip and a really customized RF front end gives really best in class power consumption also today. So what about the processor? What kind of specs are we really talking about here? Yeah, so for the application processor, this is built around Cortex M33 CPU, which is a very standard system architecture for embedded applications today. Really good thing about this, it also support trust zone so that you can build secure application that need trusted execution. And we also threw in an ARM CryptoCell 310 in there so that you can actually do encryption, decryption, and random number generation, which is needed for secure application and secure connectivity. One megabyte of flash and 256 kilobyte of SRAM is good size of memory for embedded applications. And in addition to that, of course, we have standard communication interfaces, GPIOs, ADCs, and analog functionality so that you can really build your embedded application inside the system and package and not have to put any other microcontroller on the side. So if we then take a look at what does the application circuit look like around the 9160? Inside the system and package, when you have the modem, application processor, power management, and all the crystal and passives, you basically have to connect an antenna for GPS and communication. You have to connect a battery for power, your sensors that you prefer, and a SIM card. And there you are up and running with a complete application circuit from a high-level point of view. If you go into our documentation and look at the low-level detail here, you will see that you need to throw in a few resistor and decoupling capacitors, but that's really it. You don't have to do any complex system design on the hardware side to make this work. Another advantage you mentioned earlier was low power, right? How are we going to keep our power consumption low with this solution? Yeah, so to look about low power, let me start by explaining basically three things that Nordic can help you with here and, and what we've done. So first of all, we design everything from scratch. Nordic came from the world of low power, especially in terms of Bluetooth low energy. So that's where we have our legacy. We don't have our legacy in, in Cat1 and high performance cellular systems, which are inherently high power for high performance. So we really could take advantage and build using low leakage process technology. And we really optimize the radio design also for low power, because that's what is important in these applications. When we build a dual core system where the modem and the application processor resides on the same SOC, it gives you the ability to communicate much more efficient between the application and the processor. Traditionally, modem use what we refer to as AT commands which is good to read because they are ASCII text, but they are very power hungry if you use 80 commands between a microcontroller and a modem all the time. So here we can connect in a much more efficient way using BSD sockets and binary communication so that we really optimize power between the application processor and the modem. And the last bits and pieces that since seller is pretty complex and there's a lot of variables to think about, we can also help customer with dedicated power measurements for very different scenarios. Some customers want to do quite specific things to reach their power targets in cellular. So it's very good to be able to go to someone and ask for help to do measurements. So what kind of different connection modes are we looking at here? Yeah, for cellular, there's three major modes you need to be aware of to understand power. RRC connected mode, 
where you actually transfer data and you use quite a bit of power to do that. Then you have RRC idle mode where you sleep for shorter intervals, but you're still waking up fairly often to either check if there's data coming or transferring data. And then you have PSM mode where you sleep for longer cycles to really save data and for applications that don't need to transfer data very often. Okay, so let's get into each of those connection modes. What are we looking at when it comes to the RRC and RRC idle? Yeah, so in RRC and RRC idle mode, you basically set up and start your transaction and send data. And then you can go and use DRX to go to sleep and then wake up on a regular basis to check if there's any incoming packet coming. We typically refer to this as EDRX, even though it goes under different names, because when you sleep for more than five seconds, it's called EDRX, and you always sleep in these applications for more than five seconds, I would say. The other one was PSM, right? How does that mode work? Yeah, so in PSM mode, power save mode, you go to sleep for much, much longer, and you more or less disconnect from the network, so you're not able to receive any data if there's any data coming from you. So this is typically when your application knows that it doesn't expect any incoming data for some time, and it doesn't need to send any data for a long time. So in this mode, you can go to sleep for 10 minutes, or you can go to sleep for a year, basically. So you see how this technology is made to create and build cellular devices that can sleep for a very long time and just monitor environmental changes, for example, on very slow cycles, but then again, stay in the field for many years on a small battery. Estimating power can be really useful in this arena. Do you guys have something that could help me out here? Sure. We actually have a really nice tool that we launched a couple of months back, which I think is pretty unique in the cellular world up to now. We have an online power profiler so that you don't have to buy a kit or you don't have to buy expensive equipment, but you can basically go to a web page in Nordic and test how this will work. You can configure all your settings. How is the network set up? How often do you want to sleep? And what payloads do you want to transfer? And then you will see a visualized power profile that shows you the peak current, the timing, and it shows you the average current so that you can actually estimate your battery lifetime based on the settings that you have. So this, of course, isn't a real life setup, but it gives you an estimation on what you are up against here if you want to start on doing cellular design. So you have a good estimate before you start on your hardware and start doing your own measurements. Can we get into the low power aspects of the NRF91? What kind of numbers are we really talking about here? Sure. Hard facts is always key to understand what you're able to do in a real application. So the 9160, when you are at the PSM floor and these sleep cycles for a long time, we average below three microamp, really. So it's really, really low. And then if you're looking at an application that wakes up once an hour and then goes back to sleep to check if there's any more data, we average at only 12 microamp. And in EDRX, where you sleep for shorter cycles and you have much shorter latency, we average at 3.6 microamp only. So when you look at RRC mode and you use EDRX sleep, you can see here that when you sleep for 82 seconds, you average at around 33 microamp. And then if you are asleep and you wake up only once every 10 minutes, so around 655 seconds sleep, you average at only six microamp with the 9160. How does this compare then? These are just numbers, right? So here is a overall comparison versus three other modem chips that are in the market and has been there for some time. So if we look at our RRC numbers with EDRX sleep, our average numbers is between 64 and 99% lower than these chipsets. That is why I strongly believe that the NRF9160 can enable some new and different cellular IoT applications due to its power consumption. Of course, I encourage everyone to go out and test for themselves and make their own decision what to do because each application is different. So this is just a guideline for you to to see what you should expect and what you should look for when you are benchmarking the solutions. So what about edge computing? Would this solution be good for an edge computing design? Yeah, you're spot on because I said several times that transferring data is expensive, right? And inherently transferring data over cellular is quite power hungry. So you really want to minimize how much data you're sending. So if you look at 9160 for edge computing, it's a really good solution because since you have the application processor that you can use for your own application, you can use that to make clever decisions 
before you're sending data. So if you look at the basic calculations, when you're sending data with the 9160, during that cycle, you will typically spend around 100 milliamp. If you then process data instead and run the Cortex-M33 at 64 megahertz, you will spend around 3 milliamps. So basically 30 times less. So that means that if you have an application that collect data from sensors, for example, ensure you build your application so that as far as possible, the device itself try to determine whether it should send this data or not and build cleverness into your application. Don't just send every measurement, but try and set the right guard bands so that you only send those measurements that are interesting to send and you will be able to save a lot of power in the application. Okay, let's dig into that last advantage you mentioned, ease of use, which is super important to me. Yeah, it's a great passion for me too. So it's good to get going on that topic because I've been in this market for many years and I really see that those solutions that customers like, they are those solutions that are easy to use. And we want to address a lot of customers. We want customers to be able to do a lot of this on their own and don't have to talk to the supplier all the time to get things to work. So one thing we took care of and were very focused on in Nordic when we started this project was that we really want to have strong ownership of our solution. We don't only have the module, the 9160 that we made, but we also built the chipset inside. And this means that if the customer have a technical question on the modem or the application processor, on the network, on anything between, they can go to Nordic and we will handle all of that. They don't have to go to one party for chipset question and one for module questions and, and so forth. And we think that's a great help for customer that's gonna transition into this new world of cellular connectivity. Okay, so can we get into the software side of things for a bit? What does that look like here? Yeah, so the stack on the software side can scare anyone, I think, when you look at embedded applications. So it's good to spend some time on that and try to explain what this looks like and what it means for you. So if you start at the bottom here, there's a physical layer of hardware that enables you to basically send and receive data using RF. On the modem side, there is three major stack levels to do cellular. On top of that, you get to the stack levels that most of you are aware about. IP, TCP, TLS, and so forth. So everything up to TLS, which basically take care of your secure connection to the cloud, we run inside the modem part of the 9160. And that's a certified binary that we provide to every customer so he can program into the device. So that gives you access to a set of features that you basically need to connect. On top of that, we have different higher level stacks and middleware that we run inside the application processor. The key reason for this is of course that when it comes to this level of connectivity or middleware, as a user, as a, you often have a choice of what you want to do. You have to run IP, you have to run TCP or UDP, but do you want it to run HTTP to your cloud or MQTT to your cloud or light to machine to machine to your cloud? That's very often up to you. So there we have that as part of the application processor so that you can basically pick and choose whatever you want. And all of this resides into a SDK that we call NRF Connect SDK, which is available and hosted online and Everything on the application side is also delivered as source code so that you can make any change to that as, as you want. And of course, looking a bit outside the software part of the product, you then have the cloud connectivity where you have device management, firmware over the air, and so on, where Nordic also have a cloud connectivity solution that you can test to see how that, that should work. Okay, Christian, can you tell me a little bit more about the SDK? Yes, I guess that's where you will start if you want to develop your real application. So the SDK is free and open source and something that we continuously develop and we improve and we give lifetime support on it. So many customers in this area is used to binaries, but we really use source code, but we tag it and we support it and we do bug fixes on that source code as if it were a binary release. We host it on GitHub, which I think is familiar to you and a lot of people today. And we build everything on top of a real-time operating system called Zephyr, which is gaining a lot of traction at the moment. If you look inside the SDK in a bit more detail, you have all the low-level firmware to basically connect to all the hardware, all the drivers, bootloader, secure boot, secure domain architectures, and things like that. Then you have all the system part, firmware updates, memory management, and so forth. And inside Zephyr, 
we then develop and maintain all the middleware that you typically will use, such as the protocol stacks that I mentioned, GPS clients, positioning features, and so on. On top of all this, we have an application framework and reference designs. So on the software side, we have also complete applications for how to do an asset tracker, how to do a BLE gateway and things like that. So Christian, what kind of development tools do you guys have for this one? Yeah, so on the hardware side, two type of kits. We have one called Thingy91 that you can see on this picture, which is really small, battery operated. So it's good to do quick elevation and also bring around and demonstrate new application. And on the software side, we have something we call the NRF Connect. And this is the SDK that we just mentioned. Then there is NRF Connect for desktop. This is your desktop tools that you will need. So here you install the tools, you have toolchain manager, you have compiler, you have programmer, you have other features that you need to build your actual application. And in the end, we also have NRF Connect for cloud solution so that you have cloud connectivity where you can test your cloud connection. You can also see examples of how to handle and manage data in the cloud, how to manage devices in the cloud and how you manage your SIM and your data plan in the cloud and so forth, so on. Okay, Christian, I think I'm ready to get started. Do you have a development kit that would help me jumpstart my next cellular IoT design? Yeah, I would recommend that if you want to get started and test cellular connectivity, that you get hold of a Thingy91. Really small, nice kit, battery powered. You can bring it around. You can demonstrate it to potential customer or friends or whoever you want to work with on this. This is also something that we fully open design and open source code. So if you want to build your own PCBs, you can basically take this and make whatever changes you want to do. And of course, you have available a lot of sensors and IOs so that you can actually mock up something that looks like a real application really quick. So Christian, what LTE bands are supported here? Are we just talking about US only? No, no, far from US only. This is really something that uh, you can use worldwide. That was the first thing we decided, or one of the first things we decided in the project, that we want to build a product that can be shipped worldwide. We also can support customers that want to ship products worldwide. So for LTM, we support all the major bands that are used worldwide, and the same for narrowband IoT. We have also done GCF and PTCRB certifications on the module, which means that all the worldwide regulatory certifications that you would need are done. On top of this, we have done regional certifications for all the blue regions that you see here. So really the major part of the world, meaning that in these areas, there's no additional regulatory that you have to do as a customer on this, unless you're doing something very specific, right? That require certifications on an end product level. Okay, so if I'm ready to get rolling on a cellular IoT design, where should I start? Yeah, so the first thing you need to do is to order a kit so you have some hardware to get going. The second thing you need to do is create an account on NRF Connect for Cloud because as you unpack your kit and you get connected and follow our guide on nordic.com, then you need to log into NRF Connect for Cloud, configure your first device for the first time to activate your SIM cards and, and things like that. And then if you want to get into real development, download NRF Connect for desktop. So you get access to the compiler and download the SDK and you have an IDE where you can develop and write real code. Fantastic. Well, I think we're almost out of time, but Christian, before we go, can you summarize your main points for me? Yeah, sure. Let me mention a few things which I feel that everyone should try and remember. As I mentioned in the beginning, cellular IoT is really the only wide area, low power technology that exists that can scale to a lot of devices because we rely on an existing infrastructure which does have quality of service and the security that we need. And secondly, this network is already in place. So there is no need to invest in new infrastructure or build and maintain your own infrastructure to have cellular connectivity or any type of connectivity. This is the, really the network that is covering more than 90% of the world population today and it just keeps growing. The third thing I want you to Keep in mind that 9160 is a game changer here because we have integrated more than anyone else have done. We have built a very, very low power solution. So you can build solutions that really last for years in the field with very small batteries. And we have set up a model so that you can build your application based on a lot of examples, open source code and open hardware. So it's easy for you to get started. And when a power consumption is 50 to 90% lower than what exists out there today. We really hope that 
this can help you to find new ideas for seller and enable seller at a scale that hasn't been possible before because power consumption has been too high. We hope also that when we build all the software and all the hardware and we certify it for global use, we give you a one-stop shop where you can go and find most of the bits and pieces that you need. You need a SIM card and some other things right to make this run, but you really have almost everything you need here in one place. Excellent. Well, I think we have now run out of time. Thank you so much for joining me, Christian. This was super cool. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And I really hope that I can come back and talk more detail on some of this topic one day. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Nordic Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 